Well, thank you all for joining. My name is Kerry Garrison. I'm a vice president over here at Multicopter Warehouse. And today we're going to talk about making money with your drone. And with me, I have a guest, Daniel Herbert from, um, go ahead and introduce yourself, Daniel. I mean, I'll, I'll just turn it over to you. Let you tell a little bit about yourself there. Uh, well, Kerry okay, introduced my name, Daniel Herbert. I uh, founded a company called Sky Gear Solutions, a Delaware-based S corporation back in 2011. Uh, we've been growing slowly but surely, organically uh, since then, coming up on 10 years. And um, uh, we've moved across different spaces in the industry, and now our niche focus is upon uh, almost personnel provision. Uh, we like placing um, individuals on, on larger scale drone jobs and getting them to work and getting them out there and getting this uh, technology to use. Um, we've uh, participated in a number of large projects over the last couple of years and we're continuing to do so uh, as we get deeper into 2021. So excellent. Let's, uh, uh, just before we get going too far, there are some upcoming webinars that we have uh, every Wednesday. Uh, next one is AVSS Parachute Recovery Systems for the Matrice 200 and Blue Vigil will be talking about their tether systems on May 6th. So if you're interested in those, be sure and sign up. You will get an email after this with additional information, our contact info, a link to this recording if you missed anything. So uh, if you want to watch it again, you will be able to catch that. Uh, all of our previous webinars are on our YouTube channel at Multicopter Warehouse on YouTube. So uh, let's jump right into this thing here. Uh, we're going to talk about making money with your drone, some issues about getting legal, insurance, selling your existing services, different services for getting jobs that are out there, the industry-specific jobs, and I'm going to touch on mapping and surveying as a, as a key one because there, there's a lot of stuff in there. And then we're going to talk to Daniel a little bit more about some of the, the different opportunities that are out there. First off, you do want to make sure that you're legal. If you're going to be making money with your drone, you want to make sure that you're legal. And you need an FAA Part 107 certificate if you're doing any flight that is not purely recreational. So it doesn't matter if you're a real estate agent doing your own homes or whatever it is that you're doing a farmer, you, you need a Part 107 if you're doing anything that is not purely for the sake of fun. So that's almost everything these days. <laughs> to take it, you go to a testing center, you have two hours to pass 60 questions. And my favorite uh, way of studying for this is remotepilot101.com. And there's a discount code MCW30 that gets you 30% off on that. That is a lifetime subscription. So every two years when you go to renew, log back into your account there at remotepilot101.com, get refreshed on the whatever you need to be refreshed on, plus whatever is new that may be on, uh, you know, available for you at that point. Ronald's saying he's seeing a blank screen right now. Um, oops, is that better? That's better. Okay, all right, good. Thanks, Ronald, for pointing that out. My bad for <laughs> being a little off kilter today. Okay, let's talk about insurance. You should make sure that you have insurance. Uh, there's two types of insurance, hull damage and liability insurance. Hull damage is gonna cover your aircraft in the case of any damage and liability is, you know, if you crash into someone's head, so. You can get on-demand insurance. There's companies like Verifly and Skywatch. Those are both pretty good. I've used both of those on small jobs that I've done. And that's going to run, you know, typically between 20 to 40 bucks, depending on where you're flying and when. So if you just need quick insurance just for a particular job, you can get it on demand. Or if you're looking at more standard coverage, you know, to cover your operation all year long, one of my favorite companies is Transport Risk Management. They do a great job. We have a lot of our customers that use them. And I've heard good things about Hill and Usher, but I don't have any personal experience with them. So uh, if there's any other suggestions out there, I'd be happy to hear it. Uh, someone says they're not receiving audio. Uh, well, I guess I can't say anything to them about calling in if they can't receive audio. Um, I'll just send them a message. 
Okay, for part 107, what if you are already a private pilot? That's a great question. Well, you don't need to go down to a testing center and take the 107 test. You can go on to the FAA website and there's a section there for part 107 for uh, existing pilots. If you're a current part 61 pilot, you can take this free online training and then answer the questions at the end, take that certificate to your uh, the person who would normally sign off on your flights and they can sign off on that and you're good to go. So it doesn't even cost you anything to uh, get your part 107 if you're already a private pilot. So pretty, pretty simple there. Uh, Bill, uh, AMA offers insurance through Harry A. Kosh Company. Um, yeah, I, ha I don't have any experience with that either, but I have heard that that's pretty decent. On-demand insurance is not available in New York. Uh, sorry about that. Um, can you do the recurrent online? No, you have to go back to a testing center to do your recurrent testing, which they are currently closed right now. So I believe they're just letting you go until um, you can until they open back up again. Uh, good. Okay. Bill has pasted the contact info for the Harry A. Kosh company. And I will just send that to all so you guys can see that information there. So definitely insurance is a biggie. Um, a lot of the companies that you would work for out there, a lot of your clients are going to ask for waiver, you know, insurance waivers and even ask for them to be put on it if you're doing a job at their location. I've done weddings and events, and I always have to have that venue added to my policy just for that event to make sure that they're covered properly. Uh, let's see. Droneinsurance.com has a monthly liability fee and can add additional insurance coverage for flights. Well, there's another good one. Uh, another one for Droneinsurance.com. Uh, do I know the date of the opening of test centers? No, I, I do not. Um, have no idea when they're going to open back up. Uh, if the testing facility is closed, does that mean you can't get a license until they open again, or is there online testing? There is no online testing. Um, if you do not have a 107 right now, you will not be able to get one until they reopen. If you have one and you're trying to get your recurrency, you are good until they reopen. So I think that covers that. So one of the first ways you can make money with your drone is sell your existing footage. There's stock footage sites out there that you can upload to. Some of the top ones are going to be Shutterstock, Adobe Stock, Dreams Time, Storyblock. Uh, there's a handful of other ones that are out there. I personally use a service called Blackbox, and there's a, a link there for Blackbox that I've shortened to make it easier. And Blackbox, I upload my stuff to there, and then they upload it to multiple agencies. So that saves me a lot of time in trying to upload to four or five different stock agency sites. Now, I don't go out specifically to shoot stock footage. If, it's, if I shoot something, I'm like, hey, that's kind of cool. Like this image is from a, a piece of footage that I shot um, late last year. And... I'll just take that and I'll upload it to Black Box and it goes to the, all the agencies and this particular uh, clip has sold several times. So I, without any real work on my part, I make between 60 and $200 a month on stock footage that I just thrown up there. Um, <clears throat> that's not a lot of money, but hey, it pays, you know, for gas and stuff and helps pay for, uh, you know, my gear. So it's not bad. And it's just a one other way of just making some money off the stuff. And you can go through and mine your hard drives for all your old footage and throw it up there. You don't have to go and just shoot new stuff. So selling your existing footage or selling current footage, why not? Get it up on the stock footage sites if you can. Start making some money with it. Now there's job sourcing services out there and the two Kind of most popular right now are drone base and droners.io and what you do is you sign up with these sites and they will send out job requests 
and the whoever answers it first basically gets that job and you go out fly it per their requirements and upload it and you get paid now this is not going to be full-time income for anybody this is beer money you know or gas money drone base the typical client jobs that i see are range between 40 and 70 bucks to go out for maybe an hour's worth of work plus your travel time and gas and everything else so you're not going to get rich working for drone base or doing jobs that you get through droners.io but what i like about drone base and uh it, anyone can feel free to, to argue with me about this but what i like about drone base is even if you never do a client job they have you go through a training and it's getting specific uh shots and angles and things and that's going to give you a good understanding of what a good deliverable is in a real estate market or a commercial real estate market. So it's definitely something to do just because you can get some experience out there. And if you have no other experience, then getting some of these client jobs is actually not a bad idea just to get something under your belt to be able to start getting some work. Uh, I've got a couple other questions here. Uh, do I offer video or just edits and sound? I, it's just pure video. There's no even audio. When I when I upload that stock footage, you, you don't even include an audio track. It's just one clip at a time between five and 60 seconds. And that's it. And pretty, pretty basic. Uh, let's see. To sell existing footage or pictures, can you do this without the FAA license? Well, not technically no. If the purpose of your flight, your intent of your flight is to go out and shoot stock footage, then that is not purely recreational. And then it would require a part 107 license. Now, sure, you could say, well, I was just flying for fun and I thought that would be a good one to use after the fact. That's kind of a gray area. But since shooting stock footage is not purely recreational, that would technically require a part 107 license. Uh, do you have to have an FAA license for drone base? Absolutely. That is purely commercial work. If you, if you are doing droners.io, drone base, or any of the other ones, you absolutely have to have an FAA 107 license because that is not recreational by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. So the most popular one that people say they're going to do when they come into our store is do real estate. It is by far the number one thing that, uh, what do you want to drone for? Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get out and I'm going to do real estate. I know some agents. I'm going to, I'm going to sell this to them. Well, that's great. But uh, there's almost no work for just aerial imagery for real estate. It, it's part of the rest of the imagery for that property. You have interiors, you have exteriors, you have aerials, and it's very, very rare that you're going to have an agent that just hires you to do aerials. That doesn't really make much sense. Um, it's part you. If you already are doing real estate photography, we'll then add aerial to it. But to think that you're going to go out and make some money doing real estate, I mean, the jobs out there are usually in the $50 range, if anything. So it's not really a good market to get into unless you're already doing the rest of it, in which case then, yeah, you should absolutely add to that with aerial imagery. Photo and video production. Well, it's probably the easiest to get into uh, because that's what these drones are really good at. Offering aerial footage and photos is, uh, although it is typically part of an existing business, there are production companies out there that will hire just pilots to do different types of shoots, different jobs, weddings and events. That, that's definitely a key one. I, I used to shoot weddings. I spent 10 years as a wedding photographer, and I won't do that anymore. But I have some people that will call me and say, hey, we want some establishing aerial shots for this wedding, and I'll go out and do that. I don't have to deal with people. I don't have to deal with the brides and the grooms anymore. I'm in and out before the wedding even starts. So weddings, some events, yeah, those those are good things to find. And 
I actually see some of these being listed on like Craigslist, you know, where people want to hire pilots to go out and do weddings and events. That's something to look, look into. And marketing videos for different purposes. They're, you know, video and photo is what these drones are really, really good at. And mastering that is definitely a, a great way of getting started and finding small jobs and studios that want to hire just a pilot because they already have photographers and videographers that are doing the rest of it. That can be an interesting way of getting in and getting some work. Now, probably the second biggest thing that people come into our store for is wanting to do roof inspection, you know, getting photos of hail damage and property assessments, construction and remodeling quotes, the before and after images. And not every roofer wants to do this. They, they want someone else to do it. There's a lot of outsourcing going on in this. So if you can get shots like this, which are pretty easy, unfortunately, that was actually my house. So that was an unfortunate day for me. But you, I would go out and, and call a roofing, roofing company, say, hey, do you have someone that's doing aerials for you? you know, what can we do for you? These are examples of things that we can get for you. We can get this damage. We can get before and after shots. And maybe you can get some relationships going with some different roofing companies. That would be a great way of jumping into that. Uh, uh, let's see, this is an interesting question. In your opinion, would going out with the intent to get stock footage be considered a passive recreational activity? No, it's not. <laughs> if you're going out to get stock footage, that is a commercial activity. Um, now, is it recreational at the same time? Yeah, it, it can be. And I, I enjoy flying as much as anybody else. And most of the flying I do these days, I would consider to be passively recreational. I guess that would be a word. Um, but if I'm doing it with the intent to get stock footage, that's not recreational. That's commercial. Okay, one of the, the biggest upcoming areas is agriculture. And this is not gonna be an easy one to jump into unless you understand agriculture. Uh, the new products that are out there, like the Phantom 4 RTK, these are fantastic products that can help you access and process aerial data with plant-specific metrics and parameters to show plant health, water drainage, soil, uh, density. Oh, there's all kinds of metrics that you can get with the different cameras that are available these days. But you're going to invest a bunch of money into the hardware, and if you don't know how to analyze that data and provide actionable results, this is not an easy field to get into. But agriculture is going to be one of the hottest fields over the next few years. Uh, Kansas State University told us that they expect over the next two to three years, that drone technology will help increase crop production by about five to 10%. And over the next five to seven years, it could be as high as 25%. So that cost savings and the return on investment because of increased productivity is gonna be a massive increase to agriculture. So if you have any background in agriculture, I would definitely start looking into this market as a future growth plan because there is going to be a lot of work out there in the agricultural market. Caught up on questions, good. And utility inspections, this is a big one. And this is one we'll, we'll talk a little bit more with Daniel about in a, a little bit. Uh, power lines, pipelines, cell towers. These are probably the, the hottest ticket items out there right now next to mapping and surveying, which I'll get to in just a second but utility inspections is going crazy right now. The, again, the problem with just trying to jump into here is having access to these utility companies. How do you get in with these guys to get the job? Now, if you already have a background in that and you know what those deliverables are, then it's easy to sell that to a utility company. But if you just start knocking on doors going, hey, I just bought a, a Mavic Air, and I want to go out and, and do inspections for you, that's, that's not going to cut it. You got to have experience in this market. You got to know who to contact. If you are already doing cell tower inspections, which a lot of guys do, 
switching over to using drones is making them way more efficient and productive. They can do a lot more towers in the same amount of time. But with power lines and pipelines and things, that's going to be a real specialty market. Again, this is a really growing area because doing power lines and pipelines takes a tremendous number of pilots to cover you know, thousands of miles of power lines. It's not one guy out there doing it. It's herds. <laughs> is that herds of pilots, Daniel? It's a team. Or Teams. Wow. It's a lot. It's a lot of pilots, right? Mm -hmm. So the, one of the big, big, big growth markets right now and one of the top paying ones is mapping and surveying. Uh, there's jobs in the construction area, agriculture, inspection, mining and aggregates, public safety and utility companies, all so many different uses for mapping and surveying. And this is actually a field that you can actually get into. There's software that you can download. I can actually give you trial software of PIX4D so that you can try learning the software. And if you can learn how to use the software and deliver the proper data to a customer, this is not a bad market to get into because there's so many different areas that you can work in when it comes to mapping and surveying. Construction is the fastest growing market that we see, bar none. It is exploding as companies learn how to use the mapping, the surveying, the being able, as you can see in this image, you can actually draw lines and get dimensions and lengths and calculate volumes of things. Uh, a mine may need to calculate their aggregate stockpiles all the time. So you can do that with a drone extremely quickly, way faster than traditional methods, which are taking a wheel and walking around it and then having someone walk over the top of a stockpile. That's not only time consuming, it's also dangerous. Doing it with a drone, you can do it in minutes. Let's see, Charles, are there learning resources you recommend for studying this agricultural drone market? Um, right now, there's very, very little stuff out there. And Kansas State University is probably the leading uh, school when it comes to uh, aerials and their, their use with agriculture. They're trying to get papers published and, and get material out there to help people understand how to do this. But there, there's very little when it comes to actually understanding the the needs of the farmers and what they, you know, what kind of data that they need. I am certainly not the one for that. I'm I, I can barely keep a plant alive, let alone explain what type of data that a farmer is going to need to uh, help their crops. Oh, Mark, good. Okay, Mark is making a good point. Clarify, it's not an actual survey. Right. When we go out and we are doing mapping and surveying, we are not doing mapping. We are not doing surveying. We are providing data to a surveyor who is going to analyze that data. If you say that you are doing surveying, then you need a license to do that. We, we, we don't do that as pilots. We go out, we collect the data, and we can provide that data to a surveyor who is going to do the analysis of that. that that's not on us. Uh, Unless like any of the listeners the might be, uh, some of the listeners could be a professional licensed surveyor, and they want to add drones to their arsenal. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but for the guy, for the guys who are going out and trying to find jobs that aren't in that, Certainly. don't market yourself as doing a being a surveyor. You're you're not. You are data collection service uh, would be the best way of putting that. Uh, on average, what are people billing for mapping? They've used PIX4D prior for a fire station. What is the, what is the billing back on this market for private? But that's going to depend on the market and the job uh, and the size of the job. But, you know, there's people who are doing day rates of $2,000, $2,500. There's people who are doing it by square footage at whatever rate, you know, they've, they come up with. It's definitely going to be different for different markets, different areas, you know, different parts of the country, and which market that you're trying to, to hit. You may change that based on how often that you're going out and flying it. You know, if you're offering to do a stockpile 
you know, every day or every week or every two weeks, you know, it's, you're going to base your, your fees around that type of thing. Uh, Paul is asking us, fix 4D Windows only. The desktop version is Windows only, but you can also process it in the cloud, um, which you can do it on any machine. I, I run all Mac, so I do my processing in the cloud. Uh, what altitude do you recommend for shooting mine? Uh, well, most mapping jobs are done at between 100 and 150 feet. That gets you um, good quality imagery along with, um, uh, where were they going? Good resolution, uh, good uh, accuracy on your measurement. Uh, please talk about the types of drones needed for power line work. Okay, we will get back to that one, Alan. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so what are the different types of uses when it comes to mapping? Uh, construction planning, line measurements, volume measurements, cut bill calculations. That means for a construction company, how much material do they need to remove to get to a grade or how much material do they need to bring in to, to get to a proper grade? Emergency management. Uh, a town right, right where I used to live here, Castle Rock, they would go and fly uh, a mapping mission over this big mall that was being constructed every day so that they could send this 3D map to everybody that was involved, all the construction companies, the fire department, the rescue teams, whatever, so that everybody knew the state of that job every day and what the proper ingress and egress routes were in case there was any type of emergency. We've seen this used in Puerto Rico and, and uh, uh, at during Katrina and the other hurricanes down in Florida. You can go and map an area very, very quickly and see how much damage is there, what routes are available, what streets are shut down, Emergency management is very good. Uh, accident documenting, we see that with our police departments and sheriff departments. They get up, they do a quick map, and then they can start clearing the scene instead of sitting there with measuring tapes and wheels and everything, measuring um, tire tracks and stuff. They can do that all after the fact. Uh, land management, job bidding, progress documentation, damage assessment, solar panel inspection. A solar panel inspection is a pretty good field, although you're going to need thermal cameras for that. So that's a, a higher end drone than <laughs> what uh, a lot of guys typically are going to have. Uh, agriculture, tower inspection, there's tons of different uses when it comes to, to mapping. So that's why it's such a growing field, because there's just so many different applications for it. Uh, this, what is the software name for mapping? Uh, there's an, a number of them. The, the one that I use the most is PIX4D. Uh, there's also Drone Deploy, there's Maps Made Easy, there's um, others that you can run locally on your machine. Uh, but the probably the leader in the market right now is PIX4D because they have software that's very specific to different markets. Uh, they have an agricultural piece of software, they have an earthworks piece of software, they have uh, stuff that is specific for pulling the data out into CAD files to import into uh, other design software. So there's a number of them out there. What do you need to do to get started? You need to learn the basics. And this comes down to understanding the basics of photography and videography. If you don't understand exposure, how to set your camera up, uh, shutter speed, ISO, aperture, if your camera has that, you don't understand video processing or, or image processing, these are basics that you need to know. I mean, you gotta think, you are flying a camera. If you don't know how to use a camera, well, you're, you're kind of at a disadvantage. So starting off with basics of photography and basics of videography and processing is gonna be a really key tool to making sure that you're getting good quality data, whether that is a mapping mission or whether it's just photos and videos, you got to have a good understanding of the fundamentals of base of photography and videography. Once we go from here, learn a skill, right? Uh, as mentioned before, you know, just buying a drone is not a magic bullet that's going to get you work. Uh, I see this a lot, people coming in and they're like, 
well, I got a drone. Why is no one calling me for work? Well, <laughs> you know, what can you do? If you don't have a skill set that is marketable, well, you're not going to make any money out there. Um, let me finish. Okay, I'll get back to the, the questions here. So learning how to create 2D and 3D maps is a great skill. Uh, you know, it's going to give you a broad range of skill sets to work with and understanding some of the different deliverables that you may need to do. If you want a copy uh, or a trial license of Fix 4D Mapper, uh, shoot us an email. Afterwards, I'll make sure I have my contact info up there. We'll get you set up with a, uh, a trial license so you can start playing around with it. So Bob is asking, can you change a camera on the drone with an updated, update, upgraded camera and gimbal? Well, the short answer is going to be it depends on which drone you have. If you're talking about a Mavic 2 Pro or a Phantom 4 Pro, the answer is no. Those are integrated camera systems. They're not upgradable. But when we're when you really get into the higher end jobs that we're going to talk about in a, a little bit, you're going to need a big machine. You're going to need something like a Matrice 200. Well, that machine doesn't even come with a camera. You're going to add the cameras that are appropriate for the job that you're doing, whether it's a high power zoom camera or whether it's a thermal camera or uh, some of the other sensors that are out there. So as you get bigger and bigger in the commercial areas, you're going to get equipment that fits those particular uh, niches. Uh, what link did you mention regarding law enforcement for fire scene? Um, I don't know that I mentioned the link, Bob, but um, there is software specific for uh, fire departments and uh, fire scenes. That's PIX4D React. Um, you can, again, look at that on the PIX4D website. It's great for doing very quick 2D maps that you can then do your measurements off of and get results very, very quickly. So if uh, you need that for your agency, again, let me know. That one, I have to, I can't just issue a trial license on that, but I can get you a trial license for that if you wanna uh, check that out for your agency. Um, in your experience, does Map Made Easy create good 3D map or are they more geared towards 2D ortho? Um, I mean, in my experience, the 3D maps that I've created with Maps Made Easy have been fine. Um, the biggest job I ever did with Maps Made Easy was a 42 acre crime scene for our sheriff's department. And they were blown away with the quality, being able to zoom in and move things around, you know, uh, spin it around and actually see the tire treads that were in the dirt there and see the different angles. So I had no problems with Maps Made Easy. Uh, I haven't used it in a while. And let me, I, I'll let me touch on this for a moment. Yeah, there's the, the three main ones that I've mentioned, Maps Made Easy, Drone Deploy, and Fix4D. To me, kind of the primary difference between them is their pricing models. Maps Made Easy, what appeals to me about that is you basically pay per acre. It's not exactly per acre, but that's the most simplest way of putting it. And so a 42 acre crime scene cost me $16. That was it. I mean, I, I may do a, you know, so a big mapping job once a year or once every two years. So for me to pay $350 a month or $4,000 up front for a, a perpetual license, it just doesn't make sense. So if I have to deliver a mapping project to somebody, I'm probably going to use Maps Made Easy because it's going to be cheap for me to do because I'm just not out there doing mapping jobs all the time. So I like to start with something like Maps Made Easy, get your feet wet, get some jobs under your belt, and then when it becomes more cost effective to go to a monthly plan, then you do that and you move up into something else. When it becomes more cost effective to go from there to a perpetual license, well, then you go from to there. So it, the different services, the, the biggest differentiator is the, the pricing model and then some of the features that Drone Deploy and PIX4D offers, which are things that are specific to agriculture and earthworks and some more of the niche things. If I just need a, a basic 3D map, Maps Made Easy is, is totally fine. And uh, let's move on to this finding, finding jobs. How do you go out and find jobs, right? Um, 
you need to understand the needs and the deliverables within that industry. So I would hope that some of you have some experience in something out there. And if it's real estate, great. You know what those deliverables are. If it's construction, you kind of know what those people are going to look for. If you done cell tower inspection, you know what that job is looking for. So to try and find a job in these different markets without any experience in them is going to be extremely difficult until you can do the research and figure out what each industry actually needs. They're not just going to need aerial photos. They're going to need something. They're going to either need progress shots or they're going to need uh, a map, or they're going to need cut bills, or they're, they're going to need something that you need to be able to, to deliver. It's very rare that we talk about just photos and video. We, I, I like to think of it as data. We're providing data. Uh, data can just be a photo, or it can just be a video clip, but it, it's delivering data that is useful to somebody in some way. And if you think of it that way, you start thinking a little bit different about what are you going to be delivering to that customer. So just owning a drone, again, it's not a key that's going to open doors just because you own the drone. It's just a tool. And understanding how to use that tool to create the data that a customer needs, that's where you're going to find the value, or people are going to find the value in you and help you be able to find some work out there. So what does it take? to get some of these jobs? Well, you need the right experience and the right equipment. So I have a, a quote here from Daniel. that uh, He said a couple days ago that for doing high power lines, you'll need at least 100 hours of experience to get big jobs flying high power lines. You may need to start with smaller utility companies or start as a visual observer. In some case, you'll need to own your own equipment and a Mavic Air is not gonna do the job. Uh, Sky Gear is hiring a lot of pilots to do a lot of different jobs. And last year, they paid out $11.3 million to pilots. So uh, Daniel is quite skilled at this, at this point in getting pilots into different jobs and having some work done. And as an example of some of the companies that they're working with right now and supplying pilots to, uh, it's a pretty big list. So, uh, Daniel, let's talk about this for a moment. And I see all these cool companies, Pacific Gas and Electric and stuff. What, what type of jobs are you doing for them, and what kind of data are you delivering? Uh, first of all, can you hear me now? I hear you fine. Okay. Um, and second question is, I guess you didn't use uh, Microsoft PowerPoint to import this slide, Carrie, because it's missing all the other graphics that make it look really Nice. Yeah, I, I, it'll, I have to do, it'll have to do for now. <laughs> <laughs> it'll work for now. Um, and uh, back to your question that you started off with, I totally missed because I was distracted by the slide. Can you repeat that, please, Gary? So uh, you're working with all these cool companies, Amazon, BG&E, uh, American Tower. What type of data are you delivering? To these types of companies well each each client is different uh, some clients have proprietary software that we simply deliver imagery to uh, and they just take that imagery and, and sift it sort it um, process it certain ways and then they manipulate it to to their own benefit uh, other times um, we'll provide uh, 3d models uh, for telecom companies um, where they can actually go through and, and inspect and, and twist and turn and examine a model uh, uh, for problems. Um, and th this client list here, we're, we're pretty variegated in, in where we place pilots right now. Um, the, the bulk has gone to uh, electrical transmission distribution inspection work, uh, primarily last year in 2019. Uh, we did a lot of that. And uh, so utility inspection differs quite a bit from uh, just putting pilots on media jobs uh, for film and, and TV and whatnot. Um, but the <clears throat> the actual deliverable changes considerably across different clients, even within the utility space. So if you've got one company, um, utility company A uh, might want uh, 300 photos of every single transmission tower uh, that they have uh, on their properties. 
and then another company, uh, utility company B, might want 12 photos from a Mavic 2 Pro, um, just kind of a top line, simple, uh, simple inspection work, like a, a walk-by, drive-by type inspection. Um, so it's it's very client dependent what the the end deliverable is, Karen. Okay, that, that's good. Now on a lot of these, do pilots need to have their own gear, or is there gear that's provided by yourself or by that company that they're working for? It's been about 50-50. A lot of the bulk of the work last year has been um, the remote pilots actually provide their own gear. Um, uh, we have projects already running this year where the gear is provided for them. Um, and uh, there's no rhyme or reason to that. It, it, there's, a, there's a big contention and not contention. There's a big issue there with, um, with equipment where independent contractors are supposed to provide their own tools in any industry. If you're a painter, you need to bring your own paint brushes. Uh, carpenter, you need to bring your own hammer. Um, if the company that's contracting your work provides you that hammer, or that paint brush, then you have a, a contention to be, be an employee of that company that hired you and, and you do the benefits from them. Um, so th there's lots of little ways around that, but, but that also relates to drone gear. So the drones are essentially a tool that you use to perform a service. And if you're working as an independent contractor, you really should have all the tools you need in your arsenal, uh, including the drones uh, that you want to fly. Um, if companies want to contract you and they have very particular proprietary sensors or gear that needs certain, um, uh, a certain level of security with, uh, then you can get out, you can kind of use that as a loophole and, and you, the client can provide you with the drone gear um, for a particular project. Uh, but but it's really again not to give you another non answer but it, it's really client specific um, but it's going to be difficult to get a job for a client even if they provide you the equipment to fly if you don't already have experience with that particular equipment so if a client says hey we're we're going to have you fly our our Matrice 210 V2 uh, drones uh, on these utility assets or, or what have you um, and you've never flown one before. Uh, it's going to be you're going to be hard pressed to get that particular job. Um, so just having the equipment and learning the equipment and being skilled at it is, is very important. Okay. Now you said uh, so that half of them or so that the pilots have their own gear. What kind of minimum gear is someone looking at at having in order to get any work at all? I mean, I know you. you of course, you said something like the Matrice 210 or something. On the high end, but what would be the the lowest end model that someone could have and actually expect to be able to, to get work? Well, <clears throat> let me say this, and, and you know this, Carrie, that it, it, once you've flown one DJI product, you can pretty much get acclimated to almost any of them quickly. Um, the as far as the stick movements and controls go. Um, so if you want to take your own equipment to do work on a job it will be rare to find anything that's going to take a, uh, in the utility space anyway, um, a Mavic, a Mavic Pro or Mavic 2 Pro, or anything like that. Um, it, it's not common. Uh, we do have work right now um, in the Northeast US where uh, we've got a number of pilots flying Mavic 2 Pros. Um, it's on distribution work, so the standoff from the equipment, the subject uh, of the imagery is, is not very far. Uh, so they can get the, the minimum, um, uh, not to get technical, GSD or ground sampling distance using Mavic 2 Pros. Um, but that's not common. Uh, you can expect if you want to do utility work, you need to be well versed uh, and experienced flying at least uh, in Inspire 2. Uh, Inspire 1, Inspire 1 Pro, Inspire 2, you know, that, that, that size aircraft, airframe. Um, uh -huh. uh, last year, uh, we sort of I don't want to say we set the standard, but we had so many people working and, and, and we could kind of manipulate the client a little bit um, in helping them determine what's needed to, to capture what they, they want to see on their project. So uh, we really pushed the Inspire 2 platform um, uh, with an X5S camera and a 45 millimeter Olympus lens. It's a pretty common package right now. Uh, and, and as you know, Carrie, that, that same camera gimbal and lens fit on, on a Matrice 200, 210 series aircraft also. Um, so, so that's the, the quality, you know, 20 megapixel plus 
um, and uh, uh, you know sensor size is important. Um, if you can fly an Inspire 2 uh, comfortably, confidently, um, you could pretty much get yourself in a position uh, if one opens up in, in a utility drone job. Now, talking about these types of jobs, uh, for someone who doesn't have much in the way of, of flight experience and doesn't have any in, inspection in, experience, do you often start them off as just visual observers, and is there a path to work up to being the the pilot? Yes, um, everything's changing week by week in this industry, uh, which is great. Um, but you really have to pay attention. So last year uh, we needed to uh, put dozens and dozens of two-man crews, two-person crews, in place in California um, starting in January. So the prerequisite was to have 30 hours of uh, experience flying energized uh, transmission distribution lines. Um, it was hard. It was hard to get uh, even a dozen crews together to do that um, around the country. To, to uproot, to go to California, um, you know, live in the hills, work through all this treacherous terrain and and, and take pictures with, with your, your drones um, was an exciting idea, um, but to find enough people around the country to, to just fill our clients' needs was, was very difficult. So we, we had to implement a, a training program, uh, kind of on the job or in-house training program, to get everyone up to speed um, so that they could test out, um, go through a flight qualification procedure to make sure that they, they can fly safely on, on these energized uh, electrical lines. And, um, so that was necessary, and, and, and we built up quite a body of, of quite, quite a pool of, of workers uh, that become, became very capable um, across uh, six to nine months working last year. Um, I'm actually quite proud of all of them. It's pretty significant what they accomplished um, and, and what we brought our organization up to. So they, um, they got out there and uh, with that, that 30 hour requirement, and if they didn't meet that, they could work as a visual observer. So if they had um, enough hours of experience just doing commercial real estate or, or cell tower work or, or mapping work or, or what have you, you know, had confidence and had some experience, um, some time on, on their drones, uh, they could still come out and work as a visual observer last year. Um, and then after they got a certain amount of stick time with the remote pilot kind of watching over them, the person manipulating the controls would gain the experience um, of being out there in that environment, to learn how to fly safety, safely firsthand, um, kind, of, kind of learn the ropes, and then they could test out and then perform uh, remote pilot work themselves moving forward at a, at a slightly increased pay rate also. Um, so we did that, and then what happened over a little bit of time, Carrie, was that you had we put about 150 people to work um, last year uh, in Northern California, and we had um, uh, th th this pool of pilots, this, this pool of remote pilots and, and, and visual observers that all were very, very experienced. And uh, other people around the country were making you know little classes and things to get the, that 30-hour requirement. And and I got myself put a, in a bit of an impasse where for us to preserve the the value of a remote pilot doing this type of work, we really had to convince our clients that an even greater prerequisite requisite was necessary uh, for the the hours of experience um, uh, in this work. So, so that the quote unquote new standard uh, effectively became 100 hours, uh, meaning you know our big pool of pilots that 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 did all this work and gained all this experience, you know they need they really need to be looked at with more value than than the person that came in off of a little school somewhere in the hills um, on, on test areas. So, so we, we needed to make it so the value of the remote pilot is preserved. So if we have 150 people here and then all of a sudden 3,000 people in the country, you know, take a class and then they all can get the same earnings as the people that just, you know, ripped apart their lives to do this kind of work, it, it really devalues um, the, the labor pool, if you will. Um, so yeah. there's still a process to get to get moving forward uh, from visual observer position or get involved without having the full prerequisite of 100 hours. 
Um, and on our larger projects this year in 2020, we do have uh, planned training programs uh, um, on the job to get people immersed into the industry and then get them in a position where they can work as, as a proper remote pilot on this type of work. And we're not talking Long $15 an hour jobs here, are we? No, um, the the typical work out in California um, range between about 60 and 85 an hour, um, but, but it's hard to really translate it hourly. Um, I can give you some some general numbers, um, and it's varied a little bit. Uh, it's gone up and gone down a little bit over, over the last year and a half or so. Um, the, the the typical remote pilot can expect to take at least $500 a day home. Um, on the days that they work and have some provisions given to them also, things like a per diem um, or at least partial per diem or um, transportation vehicles and fuel and everything reimbursed also. Um, you know, that, that's, that's kind of the new standard basis around that mark. Um, you know, there are some companies and, and, and we've paid, you know, upwards of 750 daily uh, to, to certain group of people. Um, and uh, but, but but it varies. You know, people talk about West Coast money and East Coast money, and there's a little divide right now. Um, you know, we, we've placed people uh, just recently um, for for thirty dollars an hour, uh, and they can work as an independent contractor for as many hours a day and as many hours a week as they want. So if it's sunny outside when you wake up, go out and fly provided equipment that you know you're set up with. Uh, rental vehicles covered, fuels covered, go out there and fly 12 hour days, seven days a week if you like. Um, and, and that money adds up pretty quickly along with another, I think we're giving about 135 hours for kind of expense assistance money. Um, and we're guaranteeing 40 hours minimum weekly. Um, so we, we try to, Skygear tries to work our client over uh, to a degree that, that it makes it so it's beneficial to the remote pilots we put in place. So. The last thing we want to do is, is say, hey, guys, here's this really cool job. Come out and do this job with us um, and then have them struggle. Uh, so, so we try to bake into our contracts as many controls as possible to make sure that if you're living far away from home, you at least have money. Uh, when it's raining out all week long, you at least get some kind of pay to pay for your hotel, or your campsite, or your, your trailer fuel or whatever it is you, you're doing. Um, and, and, but there's a divide, West Coast money, East Coast money. And, and the West Coast money that people talk about is really the, the impetus for that or the, the catalyst for that were the, the wildfires in, in late 2018. Um, uh, uh, some clients out here, just, they needed to have a lot of work done at a very fast pace. Um, and they're used to paying aviation departments multiple, multiple mil millions of dollars to this inspection. And when they see they can get better data, uh, safer, uh, cheaper, faster uh, using drones, um, you know, sprawling teams of, of drone crews um, that was enticing to them and they were willing to pay for it. Um, so we got as many people working as possible last year as we could, um, earning decent money. It ex extrapolated across a year if they worked the entire year to, you know, close to about 150000 a year. Um, and, and that was for, um, you know, well over 150 individuals that were on the project. Okay. Um, where is this guy talking about we, as in we hire people for? Okay. Well, I I thought we kind of touched on that. Uh, Daniel That's runs right. Skygear Solutions, and Skygear Solutions provides talent, which in the form of pilots and visual observers, to different companies that he has contracts with to deliver data. So he is the we and we hire people so Daniel <laughs> hires pilots to go out and do these jobs and Carrie, I apologize. Uh, like what company I, I, sh <clears throat> I should have done a quick intro again because I know a number of people on the call that weren't here in the beginning of the call where I you did a brief introduction of me so um, just to whip through it again real quick um, Sky Gear Solutions is a Delaware based S corporation uh, since 2011 uh, we've been doing a lot of different types of drone work, and in the last few years, we've specialized in larger scale projects um, in the industrial space, um, specifically last year, um, electrical transmission distribution inspection work. Um, we've put um, uh, 285 different people to work since the beginning of 2019 uh, across the country, 
uh, in a multi in myriad different industries, um, and we're continuing to do so. We we hire directly employees, or we do subcontractors uh, depending on our client needs, and um, uh, we have uh, we both provide services through use of our employees and contractors, and we also do placement service for large corporations. Um, so a lot of times we have a kind of a hire on clause after a project is done uh, for our clients to pick up those that they like the best uh, and give them full time work afterward. Great. So uh, the question was like what companies? Well, if you're looking at the slide, you're seeing the types of uh, companies that Daniel has put pilots into last year. And that's a lot of pilots. I mean, close to, to 300 pilots last year. That, that's a lot of work. And uh, I'm actually going to go back a slide in case anyone missed it here. Um, last year, in just 2019, Skygear Solutions paid out $11.3 million to drone pilots. So that, that's a tremendous amount of work. And um, I've known Daniel for a number of years now, and, and dude, I, I got to say, man, I, I was impressed. I mean, the jobs that you were doing last year, the number of pilots that you put to work, that was an impressive, impressive undertaking last year. And uh, it was very cool to see you pull that off. I almost didn't. It, it took a toll on some <laughs> health issues, but, uh, but I survived. Um, you know, we, we just, uh, another quick note, Carrie, and I don't mean to take over your webinar here, but um, uh, you mentioned services like uh, Droners IO and Drone Base, and, and Droners IO is essentially Precision Hawk. Um, and and uh, Skygear is, is, I mentioned earlier that we're, we're, we've grown organically. You know, we don't owe any banks any money. We don't have funding rounds. We don't do anything like that. We're just a, the equivalent of a mom and pop shop in the drone industry, if you will. Um, and and the, the slice off the pie that we take, you know, covers uh, diapers for my boys in school and that kind of thing. Um, you know, we're not filling uh, conference rooms full of, of needless employees and, and, and things like that. You know, so we're we're trying to put as much money back in the hands of the people that have their boots on the ground in this industry. Well, boots on the ground and the drones in the air, I guess. Um, and, and that's our <laughs> effort. And it's, it, it's been a, a slower growth than some of the other companies that are more aggressive. Um, that are essentially our competition, uh, but we, we've collaborated and partnered with many of them also. So um, I, I think it's just important to note that, that Skygear is trying to do this differently. Um, and, and we want to just, we have a, a vested interest in just seeing people actively working uh, and excited and growing the industry um, over time. That's important to us. Okay, excellent. Um... See a couple of questions here. Are there companies that lease high-end equipment? Well, yeah. I mean, you can talk to us. We have uh, companies that we work with that will handle financing and, and leasing options for you. Uh, for Daniel, here's a good question from Charles. Uh, when considering job applicants, what are the minimum requirements you look for in a potential employee who wants to begin a path towards becoming a pilot within your company? Okay, very, very good question. Um, I've got some silly answers, and I've got some answers that I don't want to say openly. Um, but the first <laughs> thing is you, you need you need to listen to instructions. Um, and this is this is across any industry, any job application, any resume submission process. Um, you need to listen to instructions. If somebody says, "Hey, uh, if you if you're interested in this, you know, send an email to this address," or um, provide these three pieces of information and text it here or whatever the instructions are, you know, one of the first filtering processes are, can this person read and write and listen to instructions and follow instructions? And, and it's amazing how many people can't. Um, that's and that's point. if you're looking for a job at McDonald's or looking for a job in a political office or in a drone company or anywhere, um, and anybody who's recruiting or hiring, uh, it, it's a severe turnoff if somebody can't focus and look at what the instruction set is um, to begin the process of working for that company. Uh, I can't stress that enough. I mean, it's it's a little severe with me because I've got some OCD and I'm really nitpicky, but at the same time, um, I've heard it multiple times from, from many other recruiters and other companies that do a lot of hiring um, that they want to see people that, that actually read what they're supposed to do and, and follow 
follow those instructions. So first and foremost, that because um, that'll get you kicked out of the door pretty quickly. Um, and uh, you know, no, one thing we look for is is we have a, we have a pretty serious vetting process now, um, and, and that includes uh, we do intense background screenings, uh, background checks. We do drug screenings. We do um, uh, you know evaluation of previous clients and things. You know, if, you, if you're operating your own drone business, we want to see what kind of what kind of uh, feedback you have, um, whether it be on on you know Google My Business or or through Facebook pages, business pages or whatnot. We want to see what kind of material you put out and what kind of feedback you have from your existing set of clients. Um, we want to know uh, how long you've been in the industry. Uh, of course, just the experience level. We want to know things about um, uh, well, experience with equipment and um, uh, your general industry experience and interaction in the industry is, is important. Um, in addition to that, though, the, you know, we need to understand that, especially if you're working in teams, um, you need to be somebody that gets along with other people. Um, you know, having that many people out there in, in a, a strange environment to them, um, we had a lot of interactions that, that weren't so pleasant. Um, and, and minimizing that minimizes the, the liability uh, for our company and for our clients. Um, so people that get along with each other, people that don't um, uh, create problems and troubles for themselves and others around them is, is extremely important. And then uh, presentability is important, you know, as with any job. I mean, this, this is all kind of generic, really. Um, but especially if we have work that's where our contractors or employees are, are client-facing in any way, shape, or form, um, they need to be um, presentable, physically presentable, um, can speak well, can interact well on a professional level. Um, and uh, a lot of us drone guys are pretty, pretty ragged. <laughs> uh, even, even some of the more even some of the more skilled ones um and, and myself included you know i'll go weeks without shaving and, and haircuts and things and you know if i'm out working and 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 i get it you know i, I get that but if, if we have somebody that's you know a singular team or a crew of a couple of people that's going to go out and do a shoot um of a um, a port somewhere and they've got ships and all this heavy equipment or whatever and the client executives are going to stand there and watch it happen you know, we've got to select people that, that are amongst us that are that can dress well and, and wear their PPE properly and not slouch and speak up properly, you know, and interact well with their client. Uh, because they're representing themselves, they're representing Sky Gear, our company, uh, and they're representing the drone industry in general. You know, we don't need to have the general public thinking people that fly drones are a bunch of, you know, rough and tumble, you know, scabbard uh, losers. Um, so we need to get out of that, that mold there. We're not a bunch of, you know, weird kids spying and playing with their toys in the air. We're, we're actually professional uh, people engaged with um, uh, real society and, and real uh, income earners. Um, so that's important. And, um, but you know, it, it's not a, it's not a catch all there. You know, we've got somebody, one of my absolute favorite uh, people that, that, that work for us regularly. Um, uh, I'll call his name out. Some of you guys might even know him. His name is Mike Mallon. I've known him for a number of years and, and he's, um, uh, beard like ZZ Top and, and just totally, you know, a wreck sometimes, you know, just if you just look at him on the surface, but he is the nicest person you'd ever meet in your life. He does amazing work. He busts his tail in the field and he always puts out uh, good data. And, you know, so it's not, you can't, you can't apply rules to everybody and say, if you fit in this box, we're going to hire you. Um, because a lot of people just don't fit in that box, but are still a good fit for the company as a whole. Okay. Do you look, uh, I mean, we have touched on experience with T and D lines, but um, what about in other types of the markets that you're addressing? What levels of experience are you, are you looking for? Um, the, the, the I guess two how major, do you quantify uh, that? Right. The, the, the two biggest targets we have are electrical T and D lines and uh, telecom cell towers, primarily. Um, and, and we're not talking cell towers like post storm inspection or insurance inspections. Um, that could be profitable, but we're, we look for more regularity. Um, so we try to target uh, uh, contracts for, for annual programmatic inspection of, of telecom structures or, or uh, utility assets. So um, 
we don't want to want off we don't want one off jobs so much as we want we want to know okay every march we're starting up and we're going to work for three months and have 40 guys working 40 people working um that, that's more our target right there because we want to assure regular work for the people that, that are with us um so those are the two primary targets there and each one of those requires a certain amount of experience now um telecom there's a number of clients that some clients require just phantom 4 pro uh, running mostly autonomous flights with proprietary uh, software um, and some pretty simple, uh, a pretty simple workflow, and and that doesn't require a lot of experience. It, requ it requires kind of a quick, um, a, a quick experience check and maybe a flight check, um, qualification check. Uh, but when somebody is, is flying a Phantom 4 Pro around one singular pole, as long as there's no guy wires and other complications, they can either figure it out themselves or get trained up pretty quickly uh, to do that somewhat efficiently uh, and, and they'll get better over time as they're doing it. Um, and that's a good end, you know, that and then, then being able to say you've collected um, 30 powers, 220 powers, whatever it is that you've done over a bit of time over a season, um, that kind of gets your foot in the door into other industry spaces also. You know, I would look at somebody, um, excuse me a second, I would look look at somebody um, a little more preferentially if they had some cell tower experience uh, to do utility work than somebody who hasn't done anything like that, <coughs> because you're you're dealing with um, site access issues and terrain and, and that kind of thing, and getting somewhere and being responsible for your 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 timing and your efficiency moving around in the field and flying um, relatively close range to a, a, a a piece of infrastructure um, and if you can do that you can usually make the transfer over to uh, electrical lines um, not too without much difficulty um, <coughs> excuse me hmm. um, so as far as getting into to other uh, fields you know that, that's we do a, a lot of construction progress and, and survey assistance kind of work or data collection for surveying, if you will, like you said. Um, and, and the experience there is, is a lot. Uh, the experience uh, bar there is a, is a bit lower. Um, there's less stuff to crash into. Um, <laughs> and, and you can kind of get <laughs> a, a good, good, thing. good bit more experience like that. Yeah. Um, did that answer uh, kind of what you're getting out there, Carrie? I think so. Yeah. Um, another question for you: uh, Is SkyGear Solutions nationwide on contracts, or just in select major market areas? Uh, all over the place. Um, we have active contracts in California, uh, Texas, uh, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, uh, Tennessee. Um, and we're starting up something soon in Oregon, hopefully uh, North Dakota. Um, so we're we're pretty scattered all around the country, but it, it's not necessarily major markets. I mean, some things are just alpha and no man's land. Um, uh, our, uh, and it's all dependent on our clients. Our clients might have um, assets that spread you know, 10,000 miles all across, you know, 10,000 miles of lines running all across a few states. Um, so it's not really isolated in just major markets. And our, our pilot network is, is extended from coast to coast, um, of course, concentrated in population centers, um, but we do have people scattered, scattered all around. Okay. Uh, Craig's asking, do you need a Part 107 certificate? Yes, yes. Work like this is not purely <laughs> recreational. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, to touch on that, Carrie, we, we have hired people that do not have it. Uh, specifically and only in a visual observer role uh, with no intent to migrate or move beyond that until they acquire their remote pilot certificate. Oh, good so point. It's not an good point. You, do, you don't need a 107 for VO. Yeah. To get hired by us, you don't. You know, you might be hired in an office position uh, to do data processing and, and, and management, um, or you might be hired um, to help us do marketing work or work on getting, you know, on approve vendor lists or whatever, you know, managerial or office type tasks uh, we need for particular projects um, or uh, just visual observer work in the field doesn't require that certificate. It's absolutely preferred. 
uh, because you, you do have more value to us if you possess that remote pilot certificate. Excellent. Uh, Barry's got a good question here. Uh, given that much of the work is remote, have you been affected by the COVID-19 situation? Hmm. Um, everybody that's been out there working for us um, has, has been considered uh, an essential worker because the majority of the work we're doing presently right now is, is, a, is on critical infrastructure. Um, and so they've been quite blessed. We've got a number of people out in California still and now new guys starting up back east um, that are all extraordinarily happy. You know, they're, they're up in the hills, you know, and no one's around anywhere. They're practicing social distancing while working, while enjoying the amazing weather. Um, and, and they couldn't feel more blessed to be doing that kind of work. And, 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 uh, and most of them are, are quite grateful right now uh, to be doing this. The, um, uh, our business, um, so far so good, fingers crossed. Um, we've had a number of projects that are slated for this year. Um, we've been told, you know, hey, nothing's changing yet, but everyone's watching our budget pretty closely and the economy and what's happening. So nothing's changed right now for, for us in this type of work. Um, but I imagine that um, our attempts to capture new business um, have been slowed a little bit. Um, and hopefully that won't be for long. Okay, um, someone's asking for your contact info. It's right there in the middle of the page, jobs at skygearsolutions.com. Been on the right, screen. Right, let me say something minutes. there, Carrie, I'm sorry. Absolutely. Uh, so if you wanna make an inquiry uh, about work, you can certainly send an email to that, that email address, jobs at skygearsolutions.com. Um, and uh, uh, we will have our, our new recruiting sign-up portal on the website probably within the next week and a half or so. Um, but for now, if you just want to drop some contact information to that email address, you'll get put right away on a mailing list that we reserve specifically for uh, job announcements and other information regarding recruitment for, for work. Um, and that'll kind of get you in the door there. And if you feel free to ping that periodically. Um, uh, but if you get something sent to that email address with your full name and any other contact info or just your email address right there that you're sending from would be fine. Uh, you'll kind of be in the loop uh, for inclusion and an invite to, to go through our recruitment, recruitment portal. Great. Um, interesting question here. I'm just starting out and I've bought and been practicing with a Mavic Mini, a Phantom 4 Pro, and an Inspire 1 Pro. How much work uh, do you think I could find outside of just doing real estate work in Long Island, New York? I don't have an answer for that, but I would imagine there's there's still quite a bit of work in that area. I yeah, mean, you're, you're more um, East Coast. Right. Long Island, um, we, haven't, we haven't pushed hard into New York. Um, there's an energy conglomerate there um, that already has uh, kind of semi-internal drone vendor, and, and they've they've trained up some of their own folks. Um, uh, that's actually a separate topic for conversation. There's some utility companies who are trying to train their own linemen and troublemen to fly drones, and other companies are saying, you know, screw that, we're going to outsource this. And we have yet to really see what model works best, but we're probably zero in on that, you know, across the next year or so. Um, Long Island, um, you know, if you're doing real estate stuff, I, I think that the next step there, you know, in our experience has been to move more toward commercial real estate. You know, if, if you learn how to take pretty pictures of, you know, pretty pictures with drones uh, of houses, um, you know, to make that next step um, uh, monetarily uh, is to move to people that have more money to pay you. Uh, doing similar work, which is kind of commercial real estate, whether that be, um, you know, new construction of warehouses or office buildings um, or office buildings that are for sale. Uh, you can find some some resources online for, for commercial lots and, and, and properties and buildings for sale and find out who those, uh, who those realtors are, who those agents are, and just start pummeling them saying hey you know here's some of my sample work and, and that's easy you can usually find sites to go around and just take wonderful photos of commercial sites 
and make that your portfolio and, and pitch that to those people that own those buildings and, and, and do that. So instead of making $19 off a drone base, um, you can make, you know, 200 to $600 doing the same kind of work, but with just larger properties. Um, but it does take a little more effort than just signing up on drone base and accepting client missions. Um, but that would be my advice, personal advice to, to take that next step with the equipment you have um, uh, to get out of just general real estate work. Okay, um, here's a good one um, from Rick. As I understand the industry, which is very little, many companies hire third party for a particular duty, but then create an in-house department for further work. Is that the way you see the industry at this time? Well, I think that goes both ways, don't you, Daniel? I mean, there's, uh, depending on the type of company it is, they some of them I've seen start outsourcing at first, and then they they move some of that in-house depending on what they're doing but i i don't see on like some of these big power line things that a utility company is going to want to hire 300 pilots so what would your what would your take be on that right it's um that's what i started touching on a moment ago it, it's I, I won't name the company right now for for a number of reasons but there's one particular utility company that didn't hire any external contractors for forever um and then they wanted to do a lot more inspection work so they pulled in a few dozen uh, people to do the work to help them along, and then nobody was happy, and they sent them all home. And then they started to do more internal, couldn't handle it. Then they brought more contractors in, um, and then they sent them all home again. And now uh, they've actually hired um, uh, Skygear to train uh, 60 of their own employees on how to fly around energized structures, energized lines. So uh, they're back and forth and back and forth. It's a pretty sizable company. Um, and uh and they're still figuring it out and unfortunately they've gone through some bumps and bruises um and made a few people not so happy um but you know they'll figure it out um sky gear has is we've put people on 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 bigger jobs and then they move them on you know move them on to another big job somewhere else with a different client and then that client is just waiting for the next big project to pull contractors back in again um Sometimes they do want to stand up their own drone program internally. Um, <coughs> when they do that, um, Skygear tries to be ready for that um, in that, you know, we sell them equipment or we uh, help train them um, and put people back on and kind of a train the trainer kind of deal and help them stand up their internal drone program. So it's, it's a model. Sometimes it becomes a model of putting us out of business, um, but that's just the way things go and we have to search for more work. Um, but again, our, our end goal is to keep people working. So if they want to hire, you know, we've got a client right now um, that's, that we've got a, a very specific agreement with them. You know, after after the provided service, um, provided contractors perform service for them for 12 months, if that if that client wants to retain, retain them, uh, there's kind of a buyout feature where they can take that person from us if, if that person wants to continue working for them full time. Um, kind of a um, a residual for a little while beyond that, and then then they then they can hire them if they want uh, full time beyond that. So so our end goal is to just keep proper professional good drone pilots working um, for as many hours a week as possible, or full time, or, or what have you. Um, but it, it's it varies varies considerably across different clients. Um, but our goal isn't to tell them exactly what they need to do. Um, we just try to advise and, and steer our client in a manner which protects the value of the drone pilots uh, in the industry working in now. Okay. Uh, so Barry's got another good question here. For power line work, how much of it is pre-programmed or automated through on-site programming or through, through an app, or how much of it requires full manual flying? Right now, the vast majority of it uh, for RGB inspection um, is manual. Um, there's there's some special software out there, and it, just talking about software is a whole other webinar in itself. Um, uh, it seems like most of the software um, is wonderful for the client it's designed for, but beyond that, it sucks. So client mm. A might work with a vendor to develop some really cool software that helps process imagery and create good selects out of it, you know, dumpable images or images that are 
you know, uh, underexposed or whatever and, and has a good data set and the software can pick and choose all that stuff, but it uses some cool AI and wonderful stuff and it's designed to work with exactly what that particular client wants. And then that company that developed the software is like, oh, okay, so company B, company C, company D, you know, all you clients here, we've got this awesome software and they show it to them and they pitch it to them and they're like, well, that's really neat, but it's not what we want. Um, so each software company, each development of software for this type of work um, is only as valuable as that first client that helped them develop it needed it. Um, so uh, autonomous flights and specialized software um, is something that's still really up in the air right now, in my opinion. Other people that develop that software might think they're the, the absolute, um, forgive my language here, might think they're the shit and they're awesome, but you know, they are for their client, but having some kind of a, a, a generic software that covers everyone's needs is sort of that unicorn, that, that missing link right now. Um, and we'll see how that plays out over the next six months or year. Um, but back to your question, which I think I'm getting away from right now. Um, the, if, if it's just RGB inspections, just images, uh, still images of structures, um, most of that done, uh, the majority of it, 2019 anyway, was done full man. I want to, I don't want to say manual for the guys that understand manual and ID mode and all that, but, but not autonomous. Um, uh, looking at uh, telecom structures, though, a lot of that is automated, autonomous. Um, so, some a lot of special flight work software is being made um, that allows you to capture those assets in a uniform manner. So all the data sets for each structure um, are very similar to each other. So that end client sees, instead of, you know, if you've got 30 different pilots working, collecting, um, you don't have 30 different types of pictures from different angles, different elevations, different altitudes, different exposure settings and everything. So a lot of that is, is automated so that the, you get a lot more uniformity. Um, across different pilots flying the same types of structures. Um, but as far as the, the electrical utility space, there's some software out there that's designed to automate a lot of that also. Um, we haven't used it a lot. Uh, we're investigating a few companies that develop some pretty cool software, um, but it's a matter of what that client needs and, and to get custom software developed for each individual client is just kind of messy right now. Um, but but okay. there's also the fear that, you know, we don't want it to be, we don't, want the industry to develop to a point that the drone pilot all they do is take the drone out put it on the ground and press a button and wait for it to be done and then throw the drone back in the truck and go to the next place um that's that's going to drive Gotta have value. value down right um but but that's right. how industry works so that's how technology works so um over time we'll see a little bit more of that coming on too okay and we'll do one last question here uh we are running way late but uh, I, mm -hmm. people are saying that they really appreciated the content and they find it very insightful. So I'm glad this has been good for everybody. Uh, one last question here. I live in Denver and have been flying the Mavic Pro and Mavic 2. I've been studying to get my part 107 soon. What types of jobs are you seeing available in the Denver area? Well, I'll, I'll go first on this one. And I see a lot of different jobs out here. The construction market is growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, there's a lot of demand for uh, different types of mapping applications. There's industrial inspection. There's roofing jobs. There's um, production companies out here that look for pilots to do, you know, aerial shots for TV commercials. There, there's a a ton of stuff. Denver is uh, one of the areas that I would call relatively drone friendly. When it, it so it's there's there's quite a bit of work out there. Uh, I've heard of some other. Uh, bigger projects coming down the road, but uh, Daniel, do you see any uh, big projects that may be in the, the Colorado area? Um, we haven't targeted heavily anything in Colorado just yet. Um, we are uh, an approved supplier for services and equipment with uh, a couple dozen different companies based in Colorado. Um, uh, we have one major client that could explode in need uh, that's based in, uh, I guess it's Englewood. It's right there in Denver area. 
Um, right here. And that's that's a couple months off. Um, uh, but it's a nationwide project. That's just where the headquarters are, so it doesn't really mean much. Um, uh, but but it's certainly our 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 sales team um, has that on our radar. Uh, we just don't presently have anything happening right there. All right. Well, that's good. Um, so, guys, uh, we do have some more webinars coming up. There actually is going to be a webinar every Wednesday at the same time, different topics, different manufacturers coming on. The, the next one is the AVSS parachute recovery system for the Matrice 200, followed by Blue Vigil tether systems. We've got uh, webinars coming up with Remote Pilot 101 to help uh, get you started on your Part 107 test. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much. I, I, I know I told you this would probably not even run an hour, but we're at an hour and a half, so I'm, I'm cutting us off. Uh, I think we could go on for another hour easily talking about this, but I uh, really appreciate your insight and what you're doing out there with pilots. I could talk for another six hours, Kerry, but I don't know if we'd keep this many listeners for that long. No, but I think if there's if there's additional interest in, you know, this topic and other ways of getting started and, and maybe some other stuff, maybe we can do some other stuff again uh, here in the near future. And, you know, I, I like providing this type of content to our customers. I think it adds a lot of value. I think if, if people like us and people like you are, are helping guys be successful, then we're doing our job. And uh, that's what gets me up in the morning. And I'm very excited to, uh, for, to be on my part of it. And I, I'm very excited to have known you for so long and see what you're doing and being able to get out there and, and helping guys make money and get jobs. I, I think it's a very exciting time in this industry. So thank you very much for, for jumping on, Daniel. And uh, this wouldn't have been the same web webinar without you. Thank you, Kerry. Happy to be a part of it.